Okay, so um, um, my name is Charles Matthew, as Martin said, and I'm an ITAM fellow, so my commute was quite short, although if you've tried to traverse these corridors, it might not be as short as, <laughs> as you'd hope. Um, so I'll be talking about work that was done in collaboration with Misha Swanreff, who is currently a, a CNRS fellow at Orsay, and Eugene Demler from Harvard. The title is Quantum Flutter of Supersonic Particles in 1D Quantum Liquids. And there's a lot to explain in that title, partly because we came up with some of the terminology. Um, so before I do that, let me just give you a general idea of uh, why we're interested in this uh, topic. So we're asking what happens to a many-body quantum system when you take a hammer to it. So um, this means that you take it far out of equilibrium. Examples of this are quantum quenches uh, or um, large hadron colliders or little Fermi colliders, as it were. Uh, the idea is that if you want to learn a little bit about a quantum system, you excite the little. And if you want to learn a lot, you should excite it a lot. <laughs> that's, sort of, that's sort of the philosophy. Uh, of course, the problem is that if you excite it a lot, you cannot, you put in a lot of energy, that energy can go into all the degrees of freedom of the system, and it's hard to backtrack exactly where it went and what happened. So the trade-off is that it's hard to understand exactly uh, how the system responds or to, to uh, figure out what exactly uh, went on. Also, if you're interested in seeing uh, coherent quantum effects in the dynamics, then if you excite the system at a range of energy scales, that introduces phase factors and typically it dephases, and you don't expect to really see uh, long-lived quantum coherence. So the reason I say all this is that we found a counterexample to these expectations, of course. Um, so let me just give you sort of a you know, poster of this talk. So we looked at an impurity injected into a tong Girdeau gas. So it's a one-dimensional gas of hardcore bosons at, uh, in its ground state. And we introduce a flip spin with a finite velocity. So it's in a plane wave packet of infinite extent with a finite velocity. And we find the most surprising behavior when the impurity is going supersonically. Namely, if you just track its velocity, it doesn't actually come to a stop. It creates some strongly correlated state that has a finite velocity at <coughs> infinite time. And its velocity oscillates. So it speeds up and slows down at a, a well-defined frequency. And what's interesting is that actually this quantum flutter, as we call it, is really a um, quantum beating between two families of states. And this quantum coherence is preserved for a long time. So OK, there's a lot to explain there. but. Uh, It'll become clearer as we go along. So, you know, uh, fast particles in media have given us a lot of fun over the years. Um, in classical systems, you can get uh, all kinds of aer aerodynamic instabilities. I thought I would say this, so you know where the word flutter comes from. If you take an airplane wing and go um, uh, fast compared to the speed of sound, you start seeing all kinds of instabilities. This is an example of acoustic shock waves in some nebula far away. <laughs> kind of cool. Um, of course, when we say fast, we mean fast compared to the pr uh, propagation velocity in the medium. So if you're looking at a medium um, which has, you know, like a photonic crystal, then you're talking about fast compared to the speed of light in the medium. And then you can get Cherenkov radiation. This is, I just took some excerpt from um, work at, recent work at MIT where they show that in a photonic crystal you can get Cherenkov radiation at any velocity because a photonic crystal has uh, speed of light depending on momentum, so it has speed of light at all velocity, all, ki all kinds of speed of light, basically. So what are other examples of physics of fast particles? Pair production is a nice example if you really go fast enough to pop particles out of the vacuum. Also, you have Bramstrahlung. So let's narrow it down. In this case, we're talking about a non-relativistic quantum medium, so no pair production. Um, in that case, you can get, again, the semi-classical analog of uh, shock waves, uh, basically take a BEC, it has a hydrodynamic uh, description with some quantum pressure thrown in. So Eric Cornell showed that you can really get uh, shock waves forming in a BC, which I believe was never published, but it's on their website. Um, so the work we're talking is disconnected from this, meaning that if you uh, take this quantum flutter and turn, off, turn the coupling down, it disappears. So it really is something new that's appearing at strong coupling in this annoying limit where we don't really know how to calculate things in general. And also, it's beyond Luttinger physics, which is related to the, the previous uh, speaker's uh, talk. Namely, you have this impurity with a quadratic dispersion, and that's, that will be very important in this uh, story. All 
right, so I just wanted to give a context uh, when it comes to mini-body quantum dynamics because a lot of experiments are, are actually t uh, starting to study dynamics. And uh, cold atoms have really shown, have really uh, been able to give results that uh, give theorists a run for their money. That's actually not that hard, but in this case, they've specifically picked a fair playing ground where both experiments and theorists can actually get uh, good results, and as far as I understand, they were chasing each other's error bars and ended up with a very small error bar. But to be able to do this, you need, you need very good uh, data from both sides. And with dynamics, we don't have that many systems for which we really have good theory. And also on the experimental side, really extracting coherent properties uh, of a coherent dynamic properties of a quantum system is very difficult. You have to produce exactly the same wave function at every step. So it's very hard to get small error bars for dynamics. And so I would say as far as there's no uh, accurate comparison to the error bar scale of the previous slide, of course there have been some nice comparisons of decay rates uh, and things, so it's really starting now. So this is a quote from Freeman Dice when he said that great advances in science usually result from new tools rather than new doctrines. So as far as experiments go, we have now this cold atom toolbox, which is really uh, allowed for uh, measurements that you know, were uh, not possible before. And in theory, it's also been a recent development thanks to big computers. Now graduate students can get millions of CPU hours and have all kinds of fun with, with big computers and really get uh, um, exact results. All right, so why, why is everybody working on impurities? Well, the answer is they've always been working on impurities because uh, if you're um, interested in many body quantum systems, the impurity problem is already complicated enough. Um, and already you start seeing uh, the new novel features of a many-body system versus a few-body system. So, of course, they, they're everywhere, right? They, they lead to disorder, uh, Anderson localization. They're very important in quantum Hall physics. You don't get this uh, quantization of whole conductance without them. Um, and uh, initially, the, the original work was on impurities with an infinite mass, which led to... Um, the ortho to understanding of condo physics, the orthognatic catastrophe. Basically, you just put one impurity coupled to infinite degrees of freedom, and you get uh, non ellipticities So now, because of these pump probe experiments and because of these uh, you know, uh, hammers in, in quantum systems, you start seeing mobile impurities, and they really haven't been studied that much, uh, theoretically or experimentally. So this is sort of a new, uh, new direction to uh, focus on. Let's go back to our physical system, our tongue zero dough gas. So these are these up spins in 1D. Um, we don't have an interaction strength to play with in the background gas. So in the previous talk, the background gas was weakly interacting. Here it's infinitely strongly interacting. And we put an impurity and allow the interaction between the impurity and the background gas to vary. We parameterize it by gamma. So remember that gamma is the coupling G between the impurity and the gas divided by the density of the background gas. So typically you think of gamma as being G of the background gas divided by its own density. This is the relative coupling of the impurity with the background gas. So now, what do you do when you have a Tonks gas? You fermionize it, right? Uh, and you can do this even when there are impurities present. So this was one of the first many body quantum systems that was solved exactly. You just uh, think of them as fermions and you're done. So now you can talk of the Fermi momentum of this Tonks Girardot gas, which is related directly to its density. You can speak of the speed of sound in the system, which is just the Fermi velocity. Okay, so we fermionized our, our gas, and now we add our impurity in a plane wave, and we take it to be supersonic, which just means its momentum is larger than the Fermi momentum, and then time evolve and solve. So, of course, time evolve and solve is, requires a lot of work. We use the beta ansatz method when they're mass balanced. And because it's an integrable system, when the mass imbalance, it's no longer integrable, but we have a variational approach that actually reproduces the beta ansatz result in the mass balance case. So we have a controlled approximation that allows us to explore beyond the integrability point. Okay, so let me check time while I let you look at this video. All right, so, so what do we want to plot? We have all the eigenstates, we can plot anything. So how about we plot this operator? So this might not be your first operator of choice, but uh, let me run you through this. Oh, actually, I have a laser point here. Oh, nice. So 
this is expectation value of row down, row up. So what does this mean? Our system initially is translation invariant. The impurity is everywhere. If you were to plot the density of impurity, you would see a flat line. If you were to plot the density of the background gas, you would just see a flat line. So you have to go to high order correlations to see something interesting. So let's just now imagine we take a picture of our system and we see the impurity somewhere. And then we, we plot the, the density distribution of the background gas in the impurity frame. So we basically measure from where the impurity is. So I take one picture. Then I take another picture. The impurity is in Tokyo. Uh, and I measure the distribution around it. And then I measure again, and it's in some nebula. And, uh, um, and so all those pictures will add up to, to something like this. This is the expectation value of what you will measure. And so what you see is as a function of time, which is measured in Fermi time, the inverse uh, Fermi energy, again, Fermi energy defined by the density of the background gas, you see that the first thing that happens is a correlation hall forms. So, so you start with a wave packet? You start with a plane wave. So what do you mean where it starts? Oh, I mean time. I mean starts in time. So I, uh, t equals 0. And this, you, that's exactly right. So, so the thing is you have to calculate. So this correlator, if I were to put here an, an x and a y, it would only depend on x minus y. It only depends on the, the, the relative distance. So now there's a lot of features appearing. The first thing is the correlation hall forms quite quickly, and we actually see a formation of a correlation hall. It forms in a couple of Fermi times. Then it knocks out the density inside the correlation hall and shoots it to the right. So it was moving initially to the right with a velocity of 1.5, 35k Fermi. Then you, maybe you start seeing some things. Hey, I see some wiggles here. If you look closely, depending on how trained you are and look at these videos, you might even see the quantum flutter, which is actually the oscillations of, of these guys. But it's hard to entangle all of the features. So what you do is you go to Mathematica, right? And you put it all together. And then you can really see all the features. So now all I've done is I've taken these videos, flipped the x direction. Now this is the positive x direction. So the, initially the impurity was going in this direction. And then I've stuck them all together. So here you see the emitted particle. So this is this peak of emitted, uh, or I should say emitted wave packet in the background gas. And here is this trench, is this correlation hall. And now if we just highlight two lines, I highlight a fixed timeline in space, I see oscillations, which are typical of fermionic system, or in this case, fermionized systems. These are called Friedel oscillations. So those would actually be nice if you could measure them experimentally. Um, so that's one, and that's uh, sort of understood, uh, but interesting. And in time, we see you can see a very faint oscillation in time. And that's the one that we're really interested in. You can actually see it very nicely here. This looks sort of like a children's slide. And you see that there's an oscillation here on top of this space oscillation. So we really have different oscillations in space and time. OK, what else uh, should we measure? OK, so let's just measure the expectation value of the impurity momentum as a function of time. So I alluded to this. What happens is the impurity slows down, but its velocity does not decay to 0. It decays to some finite value and then oscillates around this value at a fixed frequency. Incidentally, if you had started with a velocity that was below the speed of sound, so if your momentum below the Fermi momentum, then you would decay and you would again not go to zero. That's not just a feature of supersonic particles. It just generically forms a state that then stops decaying. And I'll explain intuitively why that is in a moment. But the oscillations only appear once you, uh, once you hit that supersonic threshold. So the oscillations are really, uh, really rely on being supersonic. OK, so now let's actually, we have our plot of density, density, correlation, and momentum of the impurity. Let's put them on top of each other and, and notice something. <laughs> so I mentioned before that, so this is just a zoom in. So if I just go back uh, here, I'm zooming into this part. This x direction is measured in units of interparticle distance. And now I'm zooming into the interparticle distance. So I'm looking at one interparticle distance, which is about the size of the correlation hole. And as if you. Um, look at this, you see that it oscillates, right? It oscillates back and forth. It's a weak oscillation. And at the same time, in phase, the impurity's momentum is oscillating. So this is sort of very suggestive. Because, you see, you don't need this background gas, which has a lot of particles, to move much to kick the impurity around. The impurity is one particle, right? So if the background gas just moves a bit, it really knocks uh, the impurity. I mean, these oscillations are quite pronounced. They're something like 10% of the Fermi momentum. So this is quite suggestive, at least phenomenologically. The impurity is exchanging momentum with the background, uh, background gas. OK, so what I do is, if I really want to see this, let's take time derivatives of this. 
right? So I just take a time derivative and it looks, this is just a DDT of that plot and then you can really see that it's, it's beating back and forth. And it's not a frivolous exercise to take this time derivative because this is actually, if you integrate this, it really is the classical momentum of the background gas, right? Because it's, it's uh, oh, if, sorry, if I take its first moment, uh, it would be the classical momentum of the background gas. Um, all right, so, but anyway, I just wanted to point out that you can really bring this out uh, if you do it carefully. Right, so we're not done with the phenomenology yet because uh, we can study um, you know, how it depends on different things. So we have a lot of parameters to play with, interaction strength, um, initial momentum. So let's vary the initial momentum. Here is again, this is just, you know, if your impurity starts at a momentum of 1.05 K Fermi and you plot its momentum as a function of time, it decays and then oscillates. This inset is a zoom in on this. So this axis is actually this axis. So I just took this, I took this part and just blew it up. That's what you see here. So what you notice is that these oscillations are all in phase and basically look the same. They're just shifted up or down. And incidentally, they're shifted the other way around. When it starts slower, it ends up higher at the final momentum. So that, these are features we haven't actually fully resolved. What, what's the saturation momentum? It has something to do with energy conservation, but there's still work to do here. Um, but anyway, so the quantum flutter is in phase and the amplitude is about the same. And um, of course, in the experiments, it's hard to put an infinitely long impurity in a, in a system. So typically, you would inject a wave packet, for example. And what you would get for your answer of P down, if you started with a wave packet, would be simply the incoherent sum of the contribution from each Fourier mode of the wave packet. So if I know this answer and you give me a wave packet, I, can I don't need to recalculate anything. I just sum these times the Fourier component squared and I know the answer. Meaning that if you had a wave packet peaked at a high momentum, you would just get the incoherent sum of these guys, weighted, and you would, really, you would see it. So if I, sh if I shot in a wave packet that's fast enough, I would see it, uh, I would see it sloshing back and forth. Okay, so let's try to get some understanding of, uh, of uh, what's going on. So we have two main features that we want to understand. One of them is the, the impurity slows down but doesn't uh, stop. And secondly, its velocity oscillates. This is this uh, so-called Viking helmet. Or I think if you keep drawing it, it looks more like an elephant hoof, but whatever you want to <laughs> think of it as. But so what am I plotting here? So this is the momentum uh, normalized by K Fermi. This is the energy change, if you want. I mean, you have to be careful with this axis, so you can neglect that for now. All I want to plot is this red line is just the free impurity dispersion, K squared over 2M. And this gray out area is the set of particle hole pairs. So in a one-way system, you actually have a depletion of particle hole pairs at low momentum, at low energies, and then for a, a range of momenta. The reason is, well, you have to draw a Fermi C and think, what if I create a low energy excitation? I have to put in momentum, basically. So now imagine that I start an impurity. Uh, in, this is just a recoupling picture, of course. You know, if you start dressing it, it's more complicated. But if I start an impurity here, so it has this momentum and energy, it's not sitting in the continuum, so it cannot decay. It actually is just protected from decay. So you really just get 1D protected. You know, it's just, if you sit on their Viking helmet, you're safe. I'm sure the Vikings would agree. So of course, once you go above K Fermi, then you can now decay. But the question is, what do you decay to? Do you go into one of these states and then stop decaying? Do you go down to zero? You could technically just decay down to zero. And so actually, we've shown that you don't. You actually get some protected state that stops, uh, stops decaying. And this uh, state that, was protect that is protected from decay was studied in a phenomenological approach by uh, the, these people. And so uh, they, they studied how it uh, reacts to gravity and all kinds of fun stuff. Okay, so now if we want to go beyond phenomenology, right? So we've seen all these properties and we really want to understand what's doing this. Well, okay, I have all the eigenstates, right? And I have to sum about, to really get, I mean, you, typically you can get by with 1,000, but if you really want results where, that you can publish, you need to take 100,000 eigenstates. And so these eigenstates are, are cuspy because your interaction is a delta function interaction. And so imagine a particle in a delta function uh, potential, it has a cusp around the delta function, right? Its, its derivative has a, has a jump. But all our physics is smooth, so you're trying to make something smooth out of something very cuspy. So it's like making a, 
a space shuttle out of 100,000 matches. Um, it's not very useful. You could stare uh, at the eigenstates until you're blue in the face. It's beautiful, though. <laughs> yes. That's right. Well, thanks. I hope you're talking about the flutter. <laughs> so, uh, but it's rather opaque. So, <laughs> yeah. So, not to say that flutter is as beautiful as this. I mean, a lot of respect for whoever did that. But so, um, so I have the eigenstates. I can calculate anything if I have a large enough computer, but I don't really get insight into my problem. So, let me just check. So, okay, two. Not two. So, I have eight minutes. Okay. So to get, so I just wanted to give you a flavor of this. Uh, so how do you get intuition in these uh, problems? So what's typically done in cold atom system is to take a variational approach, and in other systems as well. So this is a nice situation where we know the answer. right? Typically, if you do a variational approach, you just hope you capture the right physics. Here we know the answer, so we, we can check if we capture the right physics, or at least if we get the right answer. That's another, that's another thing. So what is this? This is a variational approach. You expand the number of particle hole pairs. So here's my Fermi C. This is just the bare impurity. Here I dress it with one particle hole pair. Here I dress it with two particle hole pairs. And we know that this method is, you know, some people are obsessed with the question of why it keeps people up at night, of why it does so well, compared to diagrammatic Monte Carlo. Especially people who grew up with Feynman diagrams find this very frustrating that this, that this does so well. Um, Anyway, so I just named some of the people. We saw some talks by, by uh, Massignon, by Peter Massignon as well, uh, on the variational approach. But it's very versatile, and you can really read off what, what wave function you're capturing. So I just thought, I mean, this is some, uh, an example of this. So uh, a while back, we looked at um, an impurity in 3D with the delta function interaction and mass imbalance interacting with a Fermi C. And so I have a Fermi C, and I put an impurity. It can dress itself and form a polaron, or it can pull a particle out of the Fermi C and bind to it, form a molecule, or it can pull two and form a trimer, or it can pull three and three and form a tetramer. As uh, Dirte Bloom showed, actually, there is a tetramer sitting here. So I'm, I'm not going to talk about this too much, but I just wanted to mention that um, without the Fermi C, there is a limit in which you you recover the results discovered in two talks. O o the molecule can have finite momentum. You get FFLO. So basically, the it's because we know what to write down when we want to study a trimer in the variational approach that it's a very versatile uh, tool. And here we have something very similar, actually. <coughs> we actually have a new guy in, in, the, in play, which is the exciton. So um, let's go back to our dynamics. What do we have? We inject an impurity, and it knocked out a correlation hole. So it has now a hole close by to it, right? a depletion. Now, it attracts, it's attracted to the hole. That's why it's forming. It's forming sort of a nest that it can live nicely in. And so as it binds to it, it can form an exciton. So an exciton is just a delocalized impurity plus whole state. And the polaron is just your, impu your typical impurity that's stressed. So once it's knocked out, the created the correlation hole, it can bind to it and form an exciton, or not bind to it and form a polaron. And we can just write down an exciton. This is the lowest order approximation to an exciton. C dagger K down, CQ up, right? Impurity with hole. And this is just your dressed polaron. OK, so we can actually get uh, the polaron and excitonic branches. The excitonic branch is just the mirror image of the polaron. So this is the energy. And of course, the exciton is bound, so it's a negative energy. And its energy difference, you may guess now, is actually, is actually the quantum flutter, the frequency of the oscillations in momentum. So because these dispersions are rather flat, if you create a quantum superposition state of states around here and here, and then you let it time evolve, it's going to beat at this frequency and decohere very slowly. The decoherence rate will be set by the, the second derivative of this, or the curvature of this, uh, these dispersions. Um, and by the way, so these are obtained with beta ansatz. So now beta ansatz is useful. We can, get, we can get this with an infinite number of particle hole pairs, but we don't really you know, care. We just want the energy. You know, again, it's, it's yeah. Again, point six, uh, huh? <laughs> we again got 0.6 for the pull around energy. 0.6. Yes, that's right. <laughs> that's right. In in 3D, you're saying? Oh, in 3D, yeah, you're right. Huh. Mm, we'll have to talk about that. <laughs> that's interesting. Oh, but sorry, this is actually not a unit. There's no unitarity, so this is some coupling. <laughs> that's a, yes. Uh, yeah, you're right. Yeah. Uh, so, all right. So now, of course, I've swept some things under the rug, right? Because it's not really a polon plus an exciton. They don't have the same number of particles. The exciton. Uh, the, so the real quantum superposition, we have to put back in the emitted particle plus an exciton bound the impurity whole state, and then we can have an emitted particle plus
plus a dressed impurity and the hole. And if I have this quantum superposition, then that's our possibly our, our explanation for a quantum flutter. So now I just draw wave functions. So we're back to this. So this is emitted particle, deep hole, and polaron. And this is emitted particle and exciton. And this hole is very deep, meaning that it's at the bottom, close to the bottom of the Fermi C, which is why this is beyond Luttinger physics. And so there's been some work on beyond Luttinger physics, and they precisely had to introduce an impurity. So this might actually be quite related to these, the first step beyond Luttinger physics, which is just including deep holes. Uh, OK, so let's test this. We have a hypothesis. So let's test it. So one thing we can do is we can compare the oscillation frequency uh, in, given in orange as a function of coupling uh, strength gamma of the impurity with the gas. Um, this is extracted from the four beta ansatz uh, matchstick uh, 100k states. And then you just extract the frequency. And then you just compare it to a very simple calculation. This is basically an equilibrium calculation, a ground state of an exciton and a ground state of a polaron. So this takes no time. This takes microseconds. And this is a, a lot more painful. And they agree quite nicely. So that's, that's you know, very suggestive, at least. Another thing we can say is, so we talked about the variation approach with two particle hole pairs. And actually, it's able to capture the lowest order approximation to the exciton and the polaron plus hole. And what's amazing is that this variational approach with two particle pairs just agrees almost exactly with beta ansatz. Right? I mean, of course, almost exactly depends on your <laughs> scales, as I heard uh, fluttering in the audience. But uh, I mean, it really just follows it. Of course, if you were to uh, take the ratio, you know, this is 0.2, so you might get a difference of 10%. But there seems to be a, a constant offset. And apart from that, it really captures the physics, right? Um, and actually, the differences can be ascribed to the fact that you're not capturing the exciton or the polaron exactly, but you're, you're doing as, as well as you can. P down is the impurity momentum as a function of time. So, so the impurity initially here is that starts at 1.1 k Fermi as a function of time. I calculate its expected momentum. That's the initial state. Initial state is a plane wave and then time evolve. Uh, that's our Q. Right, so now that we have a very short approach that has been benchmarked, if you want, at equal masses, we can now go take a mass imbalance it and look at whether it disappears. Because right, when it's mass balance, it's an integrable system. So in our case, the integrability is a useful tool to get exact results. But also integrable models, there's always this nagging question of whether the physics you're seeing is, is just because it's integral. For example, integral models <coughs> equilibrate very differently than non-integrable models because they have an infinite number of conserved quantities. And here we're talking about equilibration. But actually, w w at least this f uh, mass at the end of the day, or this, sorry, this velocity at the end of the day looks like an infinite time question, right? But if we mass imbalance it, it seems to still survive, at least for, uh, for the windows of, of mass imbalance. We don't want to go too far. But it looks like if you make the impurity lighter, it, it dies more quickly, the oscillations. So it decoheres more quickly. And if you make it heavier, it decoheres uh, less quickly, which you might say afterwards, oh, that's what I expected. But you know. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so, um, OK, so good. So at least it looks like it's robust to leaving the integrability point. And so the question is, where else would you see this? If I just take a generic system that can be phenomenologically described by Lottinger model plus an impurity, this beyond Lottinger physics, does it, is it generic? And how do you, you know, when do you get a very strong effect? Right, experimental consequences. So many people here could do this experiment. <laughs> so please do. So, uh, so it's actually not, I mean, it's, it's very standard uh, techniques, right? You just take a 1D, I mean, the Tonks gas has been made. Ah, good. So, well, <laughs> you're nodding your head, so that's, that's good. Then I have questions. But so uh, it, it might not be an easy experiment, but at least, <laughs> OK, that was your point. <laughs> but at least. The components are clear. You make a 1D tongue dough gas. You send in two uh, Raman beams and create impurities at finite momentum. Or maybe you find another way. You inject them at finite momentum. And there's this experiment by Tom and Esslinger where they look at injecting particles into a one bath, for example. So you could think of something like this. Ideally, you would really just flip the impurity, start with a fully polarized Fermi C, or sorry, Tongs gas, and then flip the impurity into a state with a well-defined momentum. And then just do time of flight. It's OK if you make a wave packet. As long as it's peak at high enough momentum, you should see this physics. And there are questions. You know, There's these gravity experiments. There are questions whether you could see signatures of this in gravity experiments. And we're working on this now. Um, 
OK, so now I have no time, right? Uh, OK, so since I have, but that's good. I just wanted to plot some fun videos. So here's, so OK, so I've talked about this uh, wave packet, uh, infinitely, uh, infinite extent plane wave. Let's instead just take a wave packet and look at it. You know, this is no more quantum headaches. Let's just look at a wave packet uh, evolving in this background gas with a finite initial velocity. So here, I, I, the coupling between the impurity and the background gas is small. OK, let me run you through this. I have 16 particles. This is the density of the background gas. It's constant initially. And this is the density of our, of our wave packet. And so you just see it still looks like a wave packet. Now you start seeing finite size effects. It's in a ring. Now if I go to strong coupling, uh, let's see here. If I go to strong coupling, you'll see that the wave packet actually gets very distorted. So this is something also that you could, you could measure um, because it's quite a strong effect. This wave packet becomes very uh, syrupy. It sort of gets pulled. And if you actually zoom into this, you start seeing little steps. So it's a bit like this train of soliton type physics. So I, I don't know exactly what's going on here. But so there are interesting features already in just mapping out the, the wave packets in real space. OK, so now uh, here's just a final uh, question. So if this is the answer, what is the question? <laughs> so, so typically, when you're in a situation like this, we know what to do nowadays. You just ask uh, Watson, <laughs> right? So, so the point is that, OK, so we've taken an infinite number of particles, but we could just take a small number of particles because actually, and put it in a ring. And people have done this. People have made toroidal traps. So put here three upspins and one flipped impurity. The radial direction is the density. So here I've started my wave packet of one impurity. Uh, I've started it pointing uh, in this part of the ring, and the other guy is um, just constant density background gas in the ground state. And then it's, it smacks against the system, and it really goes around the system a bunch of time and equilibrates. So whereas in previous simulations, I had to take enough particles to make sure I was in a thermodynamic limit, that my, that my results were valid for infinite system size. If I go back to my initial simulations, I can also learn about how a many body system, when it interacts with itself for a long time, equilibrates. So I don't think this has been studied much, but we haven't done much with it. Um, but it could be fun to do. All right, so then I'll just uh, finish here. Uh, um, <coughs> we looked at dynamics and impurity in a Tonks gas and saw interesting quantum coherent features that are propagating incidentally. Since it's at finite velocity, you just have quantum coherence propagating through a many body system that is somehow protected from uh, decoherence for, for uh, you know, a long time. And uh, OK, with that, uh, I thank you for your attention.